Okay, welcome to our monthly ICG Lab Talk series. Um, thanks for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Daniel Weisskopf from the University of Stuttgart. Um, Daniel is a professor at the Visualization Research Center at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. He did his master's and uh, PhD studies at the University of Tübingen, also in Germany. And then this was in physics, which is quite a different topic, and then he moved to or he switched to computer science and did his habilitation at the University of Stuttgart. And then he moved for two years to Simon Fraser University in Canada uh, before coming back as a full professor to the University of Stuttgart again. And yeah, Daniel is uh, an expert in visualization research. And Daniel is going to talk about eye tracking and visualization. Daniel, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you for joining in. Um, yeah, I want to talk about eye tracking and its role for visualization in visualization. It's kind of one of my more recent hobbies. And here is the, the very brief, uh, concise outline of today's talk. Um, so before I get into the actual topic of eye tracking, I also want to give you a little bit of overview of other research topics that I'm covering. And then you see the main things. It's uh, going to be a rather a talk that's more on breadth than on depth. So I will cover eye tracking as a field, rather large field, and would like to discuss its relationship to visualization. And to do so, I will also present some taxonomy so that we have the same, that we are on the same line of understanding eye tracking. And the last part, last bullet point, essentially deals with. Um, our own uh, contributions to the community uh, over the last four to five years, uh, doing uh, visual analytics of eye tracking data. Okay, as I said, uh, a little bit of an overview uh, where I'm coming from. Um, so as already introduced, I'm working at uh, the Visualization Research Center, and that's connected also to the Visualization Interactive Systems uh, Institute at the University of Stuttgart, and we are Right now, six faculty members working on all areas of visual, uh, visual computing. That includes computer graphics, visualization, also HCI, and uh, computer vision. And so we have about 60 uh, research staff at three different locations working on that. So it's very nice to have that breadth because we have plenty of opportunities to uh, cooperate then on the different areas in, in visual computing research. And here, a little bit on my own prior work. Um, so I started with my physics background working on scientific visualization. So like the, the astrophysics data you see on the bottom left would be an example of that, or more typical cybers applications in volume rendering of flow viz or tensor data visualization would be examples of those. And here's where I actually came from. I did relativistic visualization, and that was still doing my PhD times. And that would be a user interface that's applicable or useful even for small children. That was an installation that was done at the museum in Bern for the 100 years of special relativity. And what you see is that you simulate here how your surroundings would look like if you ride your bicycle close to the speed of light. So virtually we decrease the speed of light to 30 kilometers per hour. And you see all these deformations where you see essentially straight lines getting deformed to curved lines in this area. Another example would be astrophysical simulation data that can be visualized. And then it goes all the way to more standard computer graphics like illumination computations on the uh, top left, uh, top right, or non-photorealistic rendering dealing with our power wall installation, all the way to physics-based um, animation like this coupling of fluid animation and cloth animation. More recently, and that's connected now to uh, also to the eye tracking research is my work on information visualization with a large focus mostly on a network and hierarchy visualization, also including um, uncertainty visualization, as you see it on the bottom, bottom left. And on the bottom right, you see some examples of embedded in situ visualizations for uh, in, in the context of software, uh, software systems. And some other areas in visual analytics uh, cover my work in um, biological um, or visual analytics for biological data. 
And Mark and myself are uh, paper co-chairs for BioVis this year, so that links to that. And another larger area for visual analytics was covering uh, video data uh, and an example you see on the right-hand side. So there was a, a brief outline that you see a little bit of the breadth of um, uh, the different areas that I'm covering in, in the larger area of visualization. Uh, now I'd like to come to eye tracking. And I'd like to first start with a short introduction. And so if you do a standard user study, and that's why I came, or how I came into eye tracking, I wanted to understand uh, information visualization systems better. And by terms of user experiments, user studies, and if you do a standard user study, you look at completion times, accuracies, maybe you do a question there, but you never see what's the distribution of visual attention. And if you want to understand that, of course, you need eye tracking, and that gives you a very highly resolved, fine resolved uh, display of the uh, distribution of visual attention over time. And if you look at that and come back to a standard approach towards uh, how we would do user studies in, uh, in visualization research, you typically start with your research questions, you define your stimulus, uh, you define your tasks, and then you come up with independent variables and the standard ones are completion time, maybe error rates, maybe protocol analysis, analysis like think aloud protocols. So the new part here is that we now focus also on acquiring additional data in the form of eye tracking data and that's spatial temporal data. Sometimes it's also additional physiological data that you can acquire along with your sensor measurements. And afterwards, the typical type of data analysis is statistical in nature. So you have your typical p-values, ANOVA, for completion time and error rates. And the other aspect I'd like to focus on today is that we also want to do a visual analysis of the data. And I, my point is that especially eye-tracking data needs some visual analysis. And finally, that all needs to be embedded and linked to cognitive models if you want to add some of the understanding. But my focus is really today on the eye tracking data and its visual representation and analysis. So if I have this, uh, you could frame this problem of eye tracking in the context of visualization as a twofold challenge. It's a data analysis challenge that we have, but it's also at the same time an evaluation approach for visualization research. And if you look at the data, you see that there are certain characteristics of eye tracking data. First of all, you have a structure in the set in the sense that you have saccades, and between the saccades, you have these long jumps. So, uh, sorry, you have fixations, and between those fixations, you have these long jumps in the form of saccades. And in between, you don't really process anything cognitively. So, you have a space time embedding of your data but you have very specific characteristics in the form of fixations, uh, uh, saccades, fixations, saccades. And so the question is, how do you analyze that type of data? And you also look at the relevance of the task for the eye tracking data. So can we look at the collective movements of multiple objects? And can we link it to the additional spatial information that's in the background? Because we have an underlying stimulus, we want to understand how the underlying stimulus, which is very often our visualization system that we want to evaluate, how that links and evokes certain um, patterns of our distribution of attention. Okay, so it's a very hard analysis problem. It's a spatial temple of nature with these characteristics, and it's also linking to the spatial temple nature of the underlying stimulus. So with that, I'd like to now briefly reviews where uh, the eye tracking research came from. And here you see a list of the very early things like from the dating back all the way to the 11th century when people first examined that there is some eye movement going on it's essentially when you look at uh, fast single movements. So that's uh, first version of the saccades. And then people essentially looked into how we read text and how that relates to eye tracking. So people identified, researchers identified different reading strategies with different layouts. And a famous work is by Alfred Arbus, Arbus who did the eye movement um, analysis while looking at 
at, at a painting giving different tasks. I will show uh, examples of that in the next slide. And right now, we are starting essentially with eye tracking and human computer interaction. And with modern technology, we have been seeing quite some progress here. So here is, uh, as I said, a few of the example images from uh, Alfred Yabu's um, seminal work. And that's the stimulus that he used, so one picture. But he asked for different types of tasks, like free examinations or remembering a claw thing and so on. And you see very different types of gaze behavior for the different tasks. And that's, of course, very instrumental when we want to use eye tracking for understanding visualization systems, because the different tasks will have an impact on the eye patterns, eye movement patterns, and those are the patterns we want to analyze. Now looking a little bit at the technological development, uh, these are early examples where people already looked at reflections, they took uh, pho photographs, uh, sometimes they also had contact lenses, so it was something that had to be put into the eye, so that's, of course, not very convenient. So these are early examples of technology. If you look at how eye tracking is done today, we have different types of eye trackers. Um, one type is stationary, remote eye tracker, where the eye tracking device is installed here in the form of small cameras. We have variable eye tracking that you can wear with these uh, glasses, and you have little cameras either built here or at the side, and they look at your reflections in the eye. And you can use them in an inter interactive setting. Typically, these are cheaper hardware that doesn't have the same resolution as the uh, research eye tracking devices, but um, allow you to do uh, low-cost eye tracking in an interactive setting as an interaction device. OK, so that's really the starting point of the original eye tracking uh, research. and. Now let's have a look at what kind of data analysis problem we are facing if we want to analyze eye tracking data. And to do so, I'd like to present a short taxonomy that allows us to essentially position the different visualization techniques for eye tracking data. And that goes back to this state of the art report that we published uh, two years ago at, at Eurobis. And if you want to look that up, so that's also something you can find on our web page here. So the taxonomy uh, starts with this, on this course level with distinguishing between stimulus-related categories here and visualization-related categories on the right-hand side. And I'd like to focus on that now and dig into a little bit more detail. Before I can do that, some terminology, basic terminology of eye tracking. And one thing that we have first is the stimulus. I've already mentioned that name. So that's essentially the image that we're looking at. Now, the eye tracking device will report or record gaze points. So at each time, I'm sorry, there will be a time sampled version of the eye tracking device looking at our eyes and identifying where we're looking at on the stimulus that gives, to, gives rise to these gaze points. They can be. Uh, collected into fixations, so you have maybe very tiny move, movements here, but essentially you, you're staring at one position, that's the fixation, and between the fixations you have these longer chunks, the saccades. And if you collect, or if you've built this whole sequence of fixations and saccades, that builds the whole scan path. And that's essentially the pattern we are interested in when we're looking at uh, the, the reading behavior and the distribution of attention in a special temple manner. Now, sometimes you want to add some information of the underlying background stimulus, and very often this is done in terms of uh, areas of interest. And these are certain regions in the stimulus, and they're very often connected to some semantic information that you can find on the stimulus. For example, some objects that people might be looking at. And finally, you can look at the transitions between um, AOIs, areas of interest. So if you have a, a saccade that goes from one area of interest to another one, you will have a transition between both AOIs. Okay, so that's the basic setup of the data. There's something 
a slight add-on to that, and that's the so-called smooth pursuit. And let's see if that works here. Yeah, there's the video. So you see this, the stimulus. So there's this red dot going back and forth. And you see the gaze. And you also see the recording of the participant in the top part of the video. So essentially, you see that the, uh, the participant is following this red dot. And that's a smooth pursuit where you don't have the saccades. OK, so because you have this smooth following of uh, smooth motion. So that's a, a certain type of characteristic information um, that's uh, in, in the ACE data that, of course, depends on the structure of the stimulus. Whenever you have a smooth motion in the stimulus, you might also have a smooth pursuit. I'm adding this information about smooth pursuit um, with the understanding that many of the analysis techniques just ignore smooth pursuit, but rather work on fixations and saccades. Okay, so with that information, I now come to the actual taxonomy, and I start with the stimulus-related categories first. And for that, uh, we distinguish between um, techniques that work on point-based data representation with respect to the stimulus, and the ones that work on an area of interest-based uh, data representation. So if we have point-based data information, we focus on the overall movement um, of the, the gaze points and their spatial and temporal distribution. If we are focused on the areas of interest, we typically want to use some semantic annotation to add some additional information about the underlying stimulus. And we typically look into the transitions between areas of interest and their relationships. So that's the first uh, way how we distinguish um, the stimulus-related uh, visualization techniques. We can also distinguish whether uh, we have an underlying stimulus that's stationary, a static stimulus. So that would be a typical static visualization, a single picture, a web page, and so on. Or whether we look at the dynamic stimulus. So where stimulus changes over time, so typical examples would be watching a video, uh, working in a real-world scenario where you can move in the wild, or you have a dynamic interactive visualization or a dynamic web page. And typical types of visualization techniques for temple aspects would use maybe some animation to show that. If you only have the spatial information for a static image, you can use X and Y coordinates to show uh, the data on that stimulus context. If you talk about the stimulus, you also have to distinguish between passive and active stimulus content. And that relates only to the dynamic stimulus. So if you're watching a video that's pre-recorded, you cannot really interfere and change the video. Um, so typically, you have a dynamic stimulus there where you don't interact with. Or of course, in a more simpler and a simplified case, you would just look at a static uh, stimulus, which of course is passive by construction. In contrast, if you look at the active stimulus content, you can influence as the participant, you can influence the content on the stimulus. And the problem, of course, is if you have an active stimulus, each of the participants will look at different stimuli over time. And with that, of course, it's much harder to synchronize your visualization between data from different participants. So in short, typically these active stimulus content visualizations are much harder, much more, much more advanced than the ones that work with passive stimulus content. And finally, still in the stimulus context, um, we have to distinguish between stimuli that are just 2D. They can be static or dynamic. So these would be typical 2D visualizations or videos or web pages or actual 3D stimulus, where you might have a stereoscopic display, or you might have a head-mounted eye-tracking device wearing in a real-world scenario, where you obviously have 3D surroundings. And if you have a 3D stimulus, of course, you have much more difficulty in mapping the fixations or your gaze data to the underlying geometric model. OK, and here is your illustrations of just the 2D content and here of the 3D content. 
OK, so all of these stimulus-related data representations have an impact on what kind of visualizations are used. Now, you can also use more traditional visualization-oriented categories to come up with a taxonomy of the eye-tracking visualization techniques. And as visualization researchers, of course, we are much more familiar with those. So you can focus on the temporal aspect of the spatial temporal data, so focusing on the time. Or you could focus on just the spatial x, y, maybe the z coordinates of fixations or gaze points. Or you could like, or you would like to uh, to visualize and analyze both the spatial and the temporal aspect. So combining space and time, which is illustrated here in a typical space-time cube illustration. So here is a illustration of temporal information. Here just spatial, and here we have space-time. With that in mind, we can also distinguish between static visualizations that can work even for time-dependent data. So you might have a time-to-space mapping of the data, or you might have AOIs that automatically move with the dynamic stimuli and in this way absorb time and allow you to do a static visualization. Or you can use an animated visualization where you have uh, an intuitive time-to-time -time mapping of the data. But um, it's, it's quite well known that for many analysis tasks, animation doesn't work so well. So um, although it's intuitive, it might not be the best uh, type of visual analysis support for the eye tracking data here. And also, you have to uh, look into temporal coherence here, so that might need uh, complex layout algorithms to produce good results. Or you have to look into aesthetic dra drawing uh, criteria to come up with good uh, diagrams for, for such visualizations. And I already mentioned that we can distinguish between single users, so single participants and multiple participants, where we want to do group comparison or identify common behaviors and strategies that are followed up by several participants. So that, that would be another way of distinguishing between uh, different visualization techniques. And of course, the, we can distinguish between more traditional InfoBIS applications uh, and mappings that use 2D space to come up with the visual representation. And if the underlying data is three-dimensional, we typically have to get rid of some data. So we do projection or we select data. I essentially, we have some data loss here. Sometimes, therefore, people use 3D visualizations where if the underlying data is three-dimensional, like a space-time cube or the actual 3D stimulus content, uh, we don't have uh, any data loss, but we are quite well aware of all the perceptual issues that come with a 3D visualization, including uh, occlusion effects and uh, problems with the perception of uh, spatial depth. And finally, um, uh, as I mentioned, the stimulus plays an important role because it's the underlying reason for uh, the distribution of attention. And so sometimes people want to show the stimulus in the context of um, the, um, the eye tracking or gaze information. So that would be an in context visualization where you have the the stimulus here written down and uh, overlaid on top of that, you would have a heat map. So that would be a typical overlay. Or you have a not in context visualization where you might have um, some information about the X and time and Y and time uh, representation of the gaze information. And somewhere else you put, put in your uh, information about uh, the underlying stimulus. Of course, the non, not in context visualizations like those might have some problems when you want to directly relate certain distribution of attention with uh, its effect uh, or uh, its underlying um, uh, effects from the, from the stimulus. On the other hand, if you have this in-context visualization, very often you end up with a cluttered uh, or occluded um, parts of the display that also might lead to hard to, um, to read visualizations. And finally, of course, we know that uh, sometimes we have to distinguish between how much interaction we do with the visualization. So whether we need uh, or support interaction with the visualization or whether we don't do that. So in non-interactive visualizations, you would have a fixed set of parameters. The analyst doesn't have any influence. That's 
the typical way, if you have a representation of your eye tracking data, maybe for a paper printout or for some some um, some talk uh, some talk presentation. Our strategy usually is uh, to support interactive visualization, um, exploring the data, allowing the analysts to explore the data. Typically, you have some support for navigation, for zooming, filtering, and so on. So certain parameters can be changed here. And of course, that leads in, um, in the long run to including strategies from visual analytics into this uh, visual data analysis. So you add some data mining aspects, knowledge discovery support, automatic knowledge discovery support, and you link that to interaction and visualization techniques. And here you see one of these older schematic diagrams showing the structure of a, a very core structure of a typical visual analytics system by, by Daniel Kimes group. And of course, this is a generic uh, diagram that works for any visual analytics, but it also works uh, for our eye tracking data. And later on, I will show some concrete examples how we implemented uh, this type of visual analytics for our case of spatial temporal data from eye tracking experiments. Okay, so after this taxonomy, uh, we can put uh, our work into perspective. And so, um, as I already in, uh, indicated in the beginning of my talk, we're looking into rather large and complex data. We have all the gaze information in the form of uh, fixation, saccades, but this time I'm ignoring smooth pursuit. It's spatial and temporal of, um, data in, intrinsically. And we also have participants groups because usually we look into experiments that consider several participants so that we can do some statistically meaningful analysis. And as I said, we also look into the stimulus data, which is spatial temporal if we look into, for example, video data as a stimulus. And therefore, the because of this complexity of the data, visualization alone might fail. And you see examples here that lead to very cluttered representations of the, uh, uh, the, the scan path here and the scan path representation here. On the other hand, fully automatic or statistical analysis might also not be suited um, if, we, um, if we have to look into very complex problems. So we would like to combine best of both worlds, like the, the typical strategy that's follow up, followed up by visual analytics. And so what we have as issues of the standard visualization techniques, I'd like to just highlight a few of these problems that you see in um, the visualizations that come with the standard eye tracking hardware and software uh, by the uh, vendors like Toby or SMI and, and others. So if you look into uh, dynamic visualization techniques for dynamic stimuli, you might see something like a bee swarm. Uh, and that means you have, sorry, I have to go back here. So you have some dots here that can then move over time. That's a typical animated visualization. You may might have a gaze replay where you see the gaze, the fixations, and the saccades in between, but also in an animated sense. And you might have some heat maps overlaid that might also be uh, animated. But like always with animations, uh, it's very hard to use them for analysis. And here you see such a thing. So you would have to remember what's happening over time. You might remember that maybe a focus point was here, but it's very hard to see what's the spatial temporal structure um, over all these participants. So it's, it's hard to understand uh, what's the sequential behavior here and what's the behavior over time. With that in mind, I think we can do better by doing space-time visual analytics. And here, now I'd like to focus on the point-based aspects. So I'm ignoring areas of interest here. And I'd like to also focus on the spatial plus temporal information. And I also want to include and understand the relationship uh, with the underlying stimulus information, which might be a video that means dynamic. So coming back to our taxonomy, so we're looking here at the point-based representations, focusing on the mostly spatial temporal information. And here's one system that we implemented that realizes or implements 
some of our concepts that we arrived at. And um, the basic idea is that we do a space-time visual analytics. We have a static overview that you see highlighted here. And static overview uses a space-time cube representation. So you see the, the current stimulus time frame here. You see these dots projected here. Um, and you see clusters highlighted around certain dots. So these dots are the gaze points over time of the different participants. And if you see a clear cluster, that means we have synchrony between different participants, meaning that several participants essentially looked at the same position at the same time um, at the underlying video stimulus. As I said, we also need some data mining techniques. So that means we have some data mining, for example, shot detection that automatically separates out the underlying video stream into different shots. And these shot boundaries are highlighted here as well. And we have gaze clustering, as I already said. So we have some um, data mining methods applied to the space-time cube uh, representation of gaze points. And we have some interaction, so we can interact with um, data mining techniques. So we have a density filter, and we can filter for certain sizes of these clusters. So we can either show smaller uh, clusters, or we can focus just on the main clusters to see uh, the big trends in uh, the synchrony of the gaze points. And everything is linked here in the context of multiple coordinated views. So if you select certain things in one view, you see it highlighted in the other views as well. And of course, we also support here uh, the uh, tra more traditional visualization techniques that um, also appear in other visualization systems. The only thing that I would like to come back later on is the motion compensated heat map, because that's something that we essentially uh, implemented or uh, invented for, uh, for, for this system. And we also support uh, 3D scan path in space-time cubes. And here's an example now, hopefully it's working. So that shows how this video stream is shifting through the space-time cube. So the temporal axis goes along this direction here. And you see how the actions in the underlying stimulus, the video, they trigger certain synchrony of the gaze points because all participants essentially follow the hand when they are moving these memory cards. Okay, now let's skip to the next slide. As I said, uh, we uh, arrived at a, a version a variant of the heat map. Heat map is very well uh, used or often used to show distribution, spatial distribution of attention. But it has problems if we have uh, temporal behavior, if the underlying stimulus is changing over time. And to account for the motion of the underlying stimulus, we essentially extract optical flow that uh, gives us a grasp on the structure of the underlying stimulus. And then we use that to essentially go back and compensate for any of the motion that might be here. And to see what's happening, let's have a look at this example where we have the stimulus, the red dot that's moving around, and the small dots are the gaze points acquired from several participants. And so what we, of course, see is that the gaze points are moving with the flow. And they mo move with the flow, uh, optical flow of the underlying stimulus. So what we can do is we can essentially absorb the underlying flow go back by integrating back along the streamlines in the optical flow. And that gives us a certain common reference frame, temp, uh, um, spatial reference frame. And we put the heat map information then on this motion compensated reference frame. And that means the hotspots then remain on the observed object. And here you see a, a nice uh, example. So if you have the standard heat map that just projects down the heat map information, ignoring any motion compensation, we see this trail here because we had the underlying stimulus moving back and forth here. With the motion compensation, we essentially see that we focus on this dot here. You see a little bit of artifacts here because sometimes the motion compensation doesn't work uh, perfectly, 
Uh, so these are kind of small artifacts that are left over, but we see this main focus point here. And you see a little bit of latency. So that's why it's shifted slightly beyond or besides this underlying stimulus, red stimulus. Quite impressive, I think, is this video here. Hopefully this is running. So this is the bee swarm visualization of people moving this handball match. It's very hard to see where people spent most attention or directed their attention towards. If I now look at the standard heat map, you don't see anything useful here. So there's some hotspot here, but apparently in, in, the no, in nothing. If you do motion compensated, you so see that most people focused on this player and that player. And I think that's quite impressive. So nobody focused here on the goalie or the other players. So they play, they looked at the mo uh, most important players that were involved in most of the actions here. And of course, motion compensation works for certain time spans. It doesn't work for indefinitely long time spans, but for certain time spans, it does quite some good or provides quite some good results here. Okay, so that was our first approach to using visual analytics, but it was a very specific system using space-time queue. And uh, our idea was uh, to look into previous literature to see what we can do beyond the space-time queue. And the idea is that we applied techniques, uh, visual analytics techniques that are well known from geospatial visual analytics, and try to adopt them for eye tracking data. And uh, the question is, what of these techniques work? And maybe some of them don't work. So um, we wanted to explore the commonalities between eye tracking and geospatial data. We, we see that both work mostly in 2D space, and they look into spatial relationships of the data in the 2D space. Both areas also look at temporal evolution and they look at trajectories, meaning movement, uh, because trajectories serve as a highly relevant piece of information in both areas. And very often we look at groups of multiple moving objects, or in our case, multiple gaze points of multiple participants. As I discussed earlier, there are also some differences. So we have instantaneous jumps in the form of saccades that might cover very long distances, and that happens in eye tracking data. Of course, in geographic data, you don't have any, any portals where you can jump at infinite speed from one location to the other. So you have some finite speed, for example, either by walking, your walking speed for pedestrians, or your driving speed for a car, or maybe a higher speed if, you, if you're traveling with an uh, air, airplane. But there's always some spatial temporal coherence in the geospatial data, which is not true at the same level for the eye tracking data. So in some way, it doesn't make any sense to do interpolation along points um, on the saccades, meaning on the trajectories, because we don't really process um, visual information along the saccades. And the other thing is that we would like to link to the underlying stimulus, which plays a very important role, and that plays a much lesser role in the geospatial context. So we have some commonalities here, a lot of commonalities, but also some differences. With that in mind, we, we teamed up with uh, Gennady and Natalia Andrienko, of course, the world's leading experts, you could arguably say, in, in geospatial visual analytics. And we systematically went through all the techniques that they also implemented in their uh, comprehensive uh, geospatial VA system. And we went through their techniques, or these techniques, and we evaluated how well they work for the eye tracking data. And I'm not going through all the details here, but the whole list with all this information can be found on this web page. And here's just one example how, what we can do with that type of approach. So what kind of geospatial uh, VA techniques also work for eye tracking data? And what we used as, um, as the case study was data from a readability uh, eye tracking study where we evaluated different variants of node link tree visualizations. So what we have here is the underlying stimulus. So here we have a node link diagram where we have the root node here of the hierarchy, and here are certain leaf nodes. And overlaid on top of that, you see a visualization already of the um, uh, main movements of um, the eye tracking data. And the task was uh, that we had certain 
leave notes marked with red dots, and uh, participants were asked to find the, uh, the common ancestor of all of the, the leaf notes. So in essence, they had to follow from, first had to find the leaf notes, identify them, and then follow up the hierarchy until they found their common ancestor, and that would be the solution node. Okay, so, so far for the, the background information for the study, and what we did here was just some useful combination of uh, geospatial visual analytics techniques that also work here. So what we did here was uh, we clustered time intervals according to similarity of these aggregated eye movements. And you see the clustering information according to the color coding at the, the top here. And they are mostly clustered according to certain time spans that are mostly subsequent time spans. And what we cannot really infer is uh, the types of user. Uh, what we can infer from this is the type of user uh, viewing activities that we have. So you certainly see in the beginning that we see a lot of information and movement going up here from these different uh, leaf nodes. And later on, we are further up the hierarchy. And here's the green dot. That would be the solution node. And here is the last time step where we see that they confirm their information here whether it's correct or not. So they found the actual solution note here. And that's our target. And here, and that's interesting, if you want to use uh, eye tracking for evaluation, there's a lot of loss of time during the um, actual performance of the uh, eye tracking study because people are going back and forth unnecessarily. So you see by these uh, flow visualizations that you're going up the hierarchy, which is fine, but they're also going back down with the hierarchy, which would be unnecessary because participants obviously forgot about their, um, the notes that they already identified, the leaf notes, so they had to double check and go back and forth. And here is another variant of the visualization and visual analytics that we applied to that data. Um, here we grouped the type of visualizations according to the performance, performance groups of the participants. So we used four different user groups according to their task completion time. And so what we have here is just small multiples visualization of these different groups. So these are the quickest one, the most efficient ones that quickly identify the leaf nodes, go up and find the right note. And here you see a lot, for the slowest group, you see a lot of motion going back and forth. So with this small multiples visualization, um, you see the representations, the visual representation, representations side by side, but it's hard to really understand uh, what are the differences. So what you can do, you can take one of the groups as the baseline. Here we took the third one, and you subtract the others from this baseline here. So you see that group number four needed all kinds of additional uh, trajectory information here compared to this faster group, so marking green. And the slowest group spent way more time here for double checking in this region going back and forth. So you can also qualitatively understand the spatial temporal structure between different performance groups. Okay, so these were the examples that we used for the point-based uh, data or focusing on the point-based data. And I'd like to fill in the complementary approach. So looking at our taxonomy, I would now like to focus on AOI-based visualizations, also looking into temporal and spatial information here. For that, of course, we need areas of interest. And how do you arrive at areas of, of interest? So one, one approach uses just manual annotation. So you can use boundary shapes, um, fixation labeling, so if those are our fixations, these would be our areas of interest here. Or you do maybe an automatic generation by just overlaying a grid that of course doesn't bear so much uh, semantic information as the AOIs that are used uh, with the cards. And you can also use clustering, for example, based on the underlying fixation data to come up with um, AOI information here. Regardless of what kind of approach you use to come up with the AOIs, once we have the AOIs, of course, we can transform our original eye tracking data in AO, into AOI-based information. And here you see 
some of the uh, AOIs that we use for this running example of, um, of, a, of a video, um, or benchmark example of a video where we have a couple of people annotated here, and we also annotated the ball. And the ball was thrown back and forth, and participants in this test video, benchmark video, just followed uh, the motion of the people and how they threw the ball back and forth. And here you see the animation with the bee swarm and the moving AOIs. And as I said earlier during the talk is, with these definitions of moving AOIs, we essentially absorb time and put that into the AOI information. So much of the temporal behavior is implicitly encoded in the motion of the AOIs. And later on, when I just work on the AOI information, I don't really need the underlying dynamics of the stimulus anymore. With the AOI information, of course, you can do some simple approaches like adopting uh, the theorem river idea where you could see how fixations flow, let's say, from this AOI into other AOIs. Yes, yeah, so you have a flow that goes over here, or you have a flow over here. So more traditional type of theme river type of uh, visualization. We also use the AOI information in a more advanced or more, oops, it's too quick, in a more advanced um, system, visual analytics systems that was heavily based on AOIs that also includes the space type cube that we've seen before. But essentially that information over here describes the AOI information. So what we have here, it's a little bit small, but we will be seeing a video shortly. We have different AOIs labeled here. And you see the temple information here. So that's the time axis here. And these are histograms showing how much attention was paid to the respective AOI. And here are so-called scarf plots where we have on each line, we have one participant. And with the color coding, you see the color, the respective color of the AOI um, at which the uh, respective participant looked at that time. So again, here is the time axis, but now along this axis, we have different participants and here we had different AOIs. So it's kind of complementary information. Here we have participant based detailed information. Here we have more AOI focused information. And let's start the video, hope this works. To see if I can start the video separately. So I quickly go forward. So we have the scarf plot here in the bottom. And now I quickly go forward. So now you can select and do brushing and linking. You can select certain AOIs. And you see the temple evolution here. And you see that most people really focused on the car here, which obviously attracted most of the uh, attention here. And we can also do a scan path comparison, so some automatic analysis by looking at the different participants based on the AODI data here. And now we group them and we have a hierarchical clustering show here. And what we see here is that they have similar behavior here because all of them looked at that AOI here. And now I skip this video here and go back.
a few more add-ons for our uh, visual analytics system um, that build some kind of in between the AOI based representation that we've seen uh, just on the previous uh, video and uh, purely um, point based representation. Um, they use some kind of image based representation of something that's similar to an AOI. We, in this case, we don't use the actual AOIs as we've seen on the previous video where we had scarf plots and they did some color coding of uh, previously defined AOS. Instead of that, we just use little image thumbnails that take little pieces of the information that surrounds the respective gaze point. And if the video context, the stimulus, has a certain characteristic that these thumbnails bear some meaning so that they can be easily distinguished, then this mapping to these little thumbnails around the AOIs, uh, around the, the gaze points, they allow us to infer some structure of the, um, of the viewing behavior as well. So here's this illustration how it works in principle. And here you see how this works um, for a typical data set where we have a number of participants here in these gaze stripes. And they're called gaze stripes because we have one stripe of these gaze points ordered a long time in the x direction and along the y direction we have several participants in a time synchronized way put one after the other and what you see is that they have really synchronous behavior here in terms of where they look at the video and you can now focus on certain small pieces here you see that they focus for example on this kite movement here and here you see different structures here you even see a little bit the structure how the kite was moving uh, so we have synchrony here, but you also have some kind of outliers, like this one here looked at a different region here, or here they skipped and looked at the sky, whereas all the other participants looked at uh, the trees in the background. You see commonalities and differences quite easily here. The only problem here is very much time or fine time resolution, because it's essentially sampled synchronously along, let's say, 60 hertz or 50, uh, 30 hertz or some kind of um, temple sampling frequency that's consistent uh, be, uh, between all the participants. So that means that we need a lot of space along the x direction for this fine-grained temple sampling. If we want to go back to this more condensed representation that works on fixations, we can also do that essentially replacing what you saw in the previous slide uh, where we use the gaze points and the thumbnails, we replace the gaze points now by little thumbnail images around fixations. The only problem now is that between the different participants that we have here, we don't have direct synchrony. So we have an ordering in time here, but if I go along one constant x value, so meaning a vertical axis, I don't really have the same identical time. So the kind can kind of run out of sync here. In order to show the saccades between the fixations, we can do some encoding that you see here. So we have our thumbnail image here, and we can show by a colored bar image, or colored bar, we can show with the length of this bar, the saccade length, and with the color coding on this color wheel, we can show the direction of the saccade. So if you look at that image here, you see that there are for example, saccades that are a little bit longer, or here we have a saccade that's a little bit longer, and then there are rather short saccades. And with the color coding, consistent coloring means that, that uh, the saccades show in the same direction. And if you go from the original data representation, you can see um, the direct mapping to the fixation image charts. So if we have number one here, you see our thumbnail here, that's exactly this thumbnail here, and we have the saccade a that goes into this direction has medium length, so that corresponds to this little bar here. And then we are at the second fixation here, and we see this image here. And we have another saccade of a similar length, so this length of this bar is similar, but the color has changed because the direction is different. Then we are at the third fixation, we have this uh, fixation thumbnail, and this next saccade is longer, so that means that this bar gets longer. So you have to look essentially at the structure of these thumbnail images to understand where you're focusing on the stimulus. And you can 
at the same time look at the bars here to understand the saccades. Okay, so with that, let me briefly wrap up. So I think eye tracking um, poses an interesting data analysis problem for visualization, visual analytics research. And at the same time, it's an interesting evaluation method for visualization, visual analytics research to understand our visualization systems. And with that, I think we can look into more advanced automatic analysis techniques in the future with more integration, especially for dynamic problems like active contours and 3D stimuli, and also more support for semi-automatic annotation. Like always, professors don't do much work themselves, so we rely heavily on work by PhD students. Um, here, especially Kuno Kotzal's work, but also Tanya uh, Blaschek, and uh, other people at Visus, especially Thomas Ertl, and my colleague Thomas Ertl, and my postdoc Michael Burch, and also another PhD student of mine, Rudolf. And as I mentioned, we worked with Natalia and Gennady on some of uh, the aspects of this, uh, of this uh, uh, presentation here. Okay, so with that, I now switch off the slides, and I think we should come back to this representation here. So does this work? Yes. Okay, good. So I guess we do some questions. Yes, thank okay. you. First of all, thank you. Great talk. Thanks. Olga, um, yes, I have a question. Um, might be, I don't know, I'm just asking. Um, I wonder why you use uh, rainbow color maps for the heat maps. Um, does it have um, a reason, or because it's known that rainbow color maps are not the best for? Uh, colors, or does it have just traditional reasons? Because it's convention. It's convention. So because it's in all the systems, and people, the usual, the typical users, they they know how to interpret that data. And I think if we were to use another color map, they would have they would have some problems interpreting that data. Okay. So I think it's a question of, um, of of convention, tradition, terminology that's set in that community. Okay. Yeah? And the um, second question regarding the, the, the time mm -hmm. you had, I, I don't know the terminals that you had, um, where you have the image plan and or the video and where the particles or the, the gaze were flowing mm -hmm. and you had like in the center like the volume and mm -hmm. on the you have a um, something and on the uh, on the wall somehow and so mm -hmm. and other words was uh, the bottom so was it just a projection of the so the there were projections exactly so so the video was not very high resolution um, so the problem is of course with uh, the space-time cube it's a three-dimensional representation although it's static we can interact it with it but it's really a static visualization and with all especially with these gaze points, it's very hard to um, interpret their depth information. And so what we're using were just uh, um, parallel projections onto the two walls. So we have a back wall and we have a wall at the bottom. And with that, you essentially see very easily the X and Y component of the gaze points. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, I didn't explain that. So it's really just a standard parallel projection. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Oliver. Um, can you mention um, a few applications of your visualization? I understand that you use eye tracking and you visualize that there are certain applications that could be in the or whatever, and how um, much of the competition are computational attention algorithms for your approach using measurements? I didn't get the second half. So I got that you asked for applications, but I didn't get the second half of the question. Was the first half and the second half is for the same applications uh, you have your approach to use eye tracking measurements and visualization techniques you're proposing and on the other side you have computational attention algorithms that compute attention um, so how much of a competition do you have with the algorithmic side mm -hmm. okay so first for the application so my motivation was our own application, so we are our domain own domain experts. So we apply eye tracking to analyze uh, visualization systems, 
Um, but beyond that, so uh, you saw a little bit indirectly some applications like commercial videos would be, might be some application where we actually do have some contact um, is, uh, for example, for music videos. So there's the so-called Pop Academy in Mannheim that teach uh, professionals for the music industry. And so we have some collaboration there, or we have some collaborations with uh, psychology researchers that want to understand um, more in the psychology, maybe medical psychology uh, area, uh, their eye tracking data. So it goes all the way from more unconstrained psychology research where they cannot directly apply their ANOVA methods all the way maybe to these um, yeah, commercial videos um, in, in some way. The other question was about how much automatic and computational techniques are in there. And the short answer is it's getting more and more, okay? Because we started essentially with rather raw data representations like the space-time cube, and we added more and more of data mining and uh, computational techniques to do some pre-processing or some, some part of automatic data analysis embedded with our, within the visual analytics system. So I think the most critical challenge is to get more into sequence analysis. And of course, there are sequence processing or sequence mining techniques in, in very different contexts that might also be a, applicable to eye tracking data. And that hasn't been really explored to the fullest extent yet. So I think that's really where there needs to be much more research. Okay, I think you misunderstood my second part. Mm -hmm. Second part was, there are two approaches. One is to use eye tracking data, um, visualize it using your techniques, and the mm -hmm. other approach would be to use algorithms that compute attention instead of using eye tracking and measure it. Oh, I see. Okay, so that you predict yes. attention. And the question is then what? If you compare them or? Yeah. How much of, a, I mean, if you apply your mm -hmm taking measurements and visualization in particular application, for example, to find mm -hmm. out visualization techniques are good and what are bad. You could alternatively also use attention prediction um, to do the same thing. You would probably not need the visualization part in this case. That's true, I think. Uh, but you have to be careful. So what is what are the limits for these models? Uh, so there has been much work in, let's say, in, in everything that's related to video uh, video perception, so let's say for image, uh, video compression and so on to understand attention behavior, I think that's very well understood. But I would argue that, for example, for interactive visualization techniques, it's much harder to just apply these predictor techniques. And my experience was that uh, they don't work so well there. So we, even before we started doing eye tracking, we wanted to do something like visible difference operator and so on, applied to typical CIVIS and InfoVis stimuli and just didn't work out very well. So I think many of these are built for natural image viewing and they work quite well there, but for more fabricated or artificial stimuli and interactive scenarios, they might be more tricky. Could you come up with a uh, attention predictor for visualization techniques from your measurement data by learning, for example? Um, certainly you could. That's exactly what, what the, the image compre or video compression people are doing. And the tricky question really is, I think, um, you have to find a class of stimuli and you first have to identify what is a certain class of stimuli, for example, for visual interfaces, and then you could you would have to acquire quite some data and do more, more or less standard machine learning applied to that to find certain patterns there. Um, I'm not very confident that we're at this position right now to do that. I think we're still a little bit more in murky water trying to explore this design space and understanding really what are the classes of stimuli. And once we have a little bit better understanding there, I think then you could start trying to learn these predictors. But that would be really the grand, grand challenge in some way. So if you could completely model how we interact with, with interactive visualizations. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yeah, Michel? 
um, regarding this the learning, the learning uh, the attention mechanism. Uh, if you have a lot of, of eye tracking data, you mm -hmm. can just put it into a neural network and get a network which predicts it pretty nicely. But I'm saying I'm saying arguing that the, this 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 space we're working in, if you don't put any more information into the system, it's just too big to learn anything. Uh, maybe it helps to learn tasks so that you know what the user like the user is trying to solve a location task. So trying mm -hmm. to locate something in the visualization or trying to get it over. So I think I think brute force machine learning might be not the right thing because the space is too big. Maybe if you link to some cognitive architectures, let's say you take an ACTAR model. So that's a language to describe how we, um, or that models um, um, cognitive processes when we work with a visual interface. So maybe that would be the best hope that you have some cognitive modeling, kind of top down modeling, and then you take uh, acquire quite some uh, eye tracking data and you try to fit and learn based on some underlying model space. So I think if you start from scratch, just acquire lots of eye tracking data, it will probably not lead to very reliable results. That's my, that's my uh, concern here. Okay. And you will probably see the very highly salient stuff that, you, that we already know, but that might be not the most interesting information. So if you start blinking somewhere, yeah, that, that always works, that attracts some attention, okay? But that might be not the relevant, relevant, the relevant information we'd like to learn about attention in a visual interface. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we're running out of time. Thanks, Daniel, again. Okay, thank you for your attention. I just want to announce the, our next speaker. Okay. I'm saying goodbye. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Um, our, our next speaker, our next talk is in two weeks from now. It's um, Professor Bettina Heise here from And she's from the Department of Knowledge Based Mathematical Systems. And her talk is on the 10th of May. Um, and it will also be here at JPU. But this time she's, of course, uh, here in this other remote talk. Okay, again, thanks for joining us today and have a nice rest of the week. Thank you.